Today, we will enter a field of expertise of mine that I can actually talk uh, firsthand of. I mean, while I really love books and reading, um, I have to admit that I have never printed a book. Although I can use a typewriter, um, my knowledge of print is um, very secondary. About the media that we are now entering, um, which is the 20th century media, I have actually work expertise because most of my professional life I've been working in commercial media production, namely in television and video. So um, uh, here comes now uh, my own story a bit into um, technology and uh, communication. Um, so uh, please forgive me uh, if things become a bit more personal than usual. So um, uh, we, we start, however, in the 19th century still um, and transition from print into a world of images. So while the uh, invention of the movable type in Europe led to a great um, explosion in printed matter and um, in particular a speeding up of, um, uh, of the availability of very current text that led, of course, then to the newspaper as the uh, leading media, the leading form of publishing um, in the late 18th and 19th century. So you're speaking about the time of um, 1780 to, 19, uh, to 1850. So that is the time after the uh, French Revolution, which took place um, in 1789, it's a bit later than the American Revolution, which um, uh, took place in 1776. Uh, so we are um, post-revolutionary. The world has really changed um, in the US, in Europe, in Haiti. That was actually the first revolution that took place, that Haiti um, th um, threw off the uh, yolk of colonial oppression. So these three countries kicked off a whole series of revolution in the early 19th century. So the early 19th century, the time between 1800 and 1850, is really characterized by revolutions that take place. That means people going to the street and demanding the resignation of the ruling monarch. Um, every like 10 to 15 years, there was a major revolution going on somewhere, mo mostly in France. So the French kept kind of revolutionizing. And um, the medium that was most prominent at the time, of course, is the newspaper. The newspaper is the dominant medium of the 19th century. And the newspaper um, has a, um, a, a very strong um, tie to language, which means it only addresses people who speak the same language. If you think of painting, I mean, you can look at the painting without knowing anything about the language the painter would have spoken. So for example, in religious imagery, um, it is no, no much uh, of that importance if you have the Bible in a certain translation or not, or if you know um, about the scripture in Arabic uh, or in Persian, or any other language that people locally might talk, as long as you have an image that conveys the meaning um, it is working across cultures. With newspapers, with print, this is no longer true. Very few people were literate enough to be fluent in a language so that they could read books in other languages than their own. Maybe you would know one other language or two, but uh, uh, you could certainly not have a global knowledge of languages um, and, and read print in any language. This is true to our date. So print is um, co-existing, um, uh, is kind of complementary with a movement that also took place at these times, which is the formation of national societies that was not so much um, existing before. So the French Revolution is a turning point in Europe, as is the American Revolution in the Americas of defining your own country as a nation, which has in its word natio, which means born. So it is people born in the same place. That is the idea of a nation. 
that was not so much important before. I mean, people certainly had a concept that people would come from different places. This is actually where the word comes from. Naciones is groups of students of different ethnic, uh, ethnic um, backgrounds in a university. So that is an Italian concept. In the early times of European universities, you would have these different nations of students, but it was not meant that they come from a place that's kind of surrounded by borders. This concept is truly um, a, a concept of the 19th century. So in the 19th century, we have the rise of the nation, the concept of a national economy also. That means that you defend your own economic interests against economic interests of other nations by, for example, introducing tolls and tariffs and by requiring all kinds of documents for people to cross your borders. So all that happened, I mean, and was really a grateful vessel for this medium that would serve this purpose so well, which is the newspaper. So the newspaper is really the tool for the nationalists to foster their national endeavor. So the linguistic turn, the turn towards the written letter that takes place around 1800 is actually also the turn towards the nation. And of course, I mean, uh, thinking of the lecture on um, techno-determinism, uh, it is very um, 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 tempting, it's very tempting to say it is print that caused the nation. However, this is not true, of course. It is a co-evolution. The formation of the nation has a lot to do with population density, with the invention of uh, a money economy, um, with specialization in the trades, and so on. Uh, and then, of course, with the concept of the levé en masse, that means the, the, the draft, that means defending your revolutionary goal um, against the aristocracy of the other countries that would try to overthrow your revolution. So this idea of going to the weapons and rallying around the flag for your common goal of revolution in the United States and in France is, of course, a major driver for, national, um, for the national idea. And I mean, other people were not stupid. They would see that that worked out pretty well and would adopt it. Like when Napoleon um, um, would successfully um, subject most of Central Europe, um, namely Germany and Italy, um, under uh, his rule, um, people would use the national story um, to, to organize resistance against what they would see as the French occupation. I mean, at the same point, of course, that was always driven by interest. So, for example, the Prussian king um, was by no means a nationalist. I mean, there is enough uh, written evidence that uh, uh, King Friedrich Wilhelm, Frederick William, um, at the time um, uh, of the revolution, um, was seeing nationalist ideas as totally destructive of imperialism, which is kind of the opposite of nationalism. So nationalism is we keep to ourselves, imperialism is we conquer everyone else. Um, so uh, uh, it's kind of a, a, a difficult uh, um, narrative if you say uh, we have a, a nationalism and we close off our borders versus is we, um, we, we rob together a whole empire, like for example, Austria-Hungary which is an empire that consisted of many different ethnicities, people of all kinds of different languages, uh, German, Italian, um, uh, Serbo-Croatian, Czech, Slovak, Hungarian. Um, so languages that are not even closely related within one big country. We will look into that in, um, uh, a bit later too. So the idea of nationalism um, is there as a vehicle for all kinds of power, economic power and uh, political power. And the newspaper is a major tool to achieve that. So the newspaper is kind of the tangible um, uh, uh, remnant, the fossil of the time of the nation. 
with the invention of photography in the 1830s that gets shifted. And this is the first story that we will uh, um, uh, look at in today's lecture. So photography um, has people uh, behind it that we can name. So there is inventors that probably were really the main drivers, although there is a long history of understanding the chemistry of uh, light sensitive chemicals. It was two French um, uh, inventors, um, uh, Louis Daguerre and Nisphor Niepce, uh, who uh, first understood how to keep the chemical reaction stable so that the image that you would create stays. So I am looking at the eyes that looked at the emperor. This is what Roland Barthes, uh, Roland Barthes is, is one of the uh, major thinker in media theory and theory of photography and semiotics in the late 20th century. And this is how he describes this um, picture of uh, the youngest brother of Napoleon Bonaparte, Jerome Bonaparte. So this picture was taken around 1852. And um, I mean, indeed, I mean, you see the uh, family similarity. If you know uh, pictures of uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, they were painted or drawn, you see his brother resembling him. So, and Bart says, I mean, the fascinating thing about photography is that it looks back at you, that there is actually the, the, the real person that we see, it is not mediated through someone painting. That is at least what you could think that happened. There is an objective that makes the photograph, photography. It is a mechanical process that imprints what the apparatus sees not what the photographer sees. Yeah, this is of course not entirely true. As everyone knows, um, there is a lot of um, subjectivity in photography and it is highly artificial. If you look at this portrait, it is by no means more natural than the painted portrait. I mean, right the opposite, the exposure time um, in the 1850s was still so long that a person had to stand very still over like 10 minutes. And probably he had a stand behind him on which his back was fixed so that he wouldn't move. This is how um, the, the pictures were taken. And also, I mean, if you see the slightly frightened expression on uh, the face of Jerome Bonaparte, I mean, this comes from the flashlight that was used. The chemicals for the flash that were used created a huge explosion of bluish light that was blinding. And um, I mean, people had always these kind of sort of scared expressions because this is really this like, oh God, I am going to die expression because there is so much fire in the room. And, um, and the smell, of course, was horrible too. And then stay kind of in this stoic, uh, expressionless way, um, I think that was very difficult and probably they uh, took many, um, uh, um, uh, they, they needed many attempts uh, before a photo was really good enough uh, to, to uh, be kept. Um, very interesting is that photography almost immediately leads to the idea of movement. So Edward Muybridge um, is an American inventor in California um, uh, who did really a uh, very interesting experiment. So in the 19th century, um, it became more and more um, uh, scientific debate um, on, on how animals live. Uh, that was driven by the uh, enormous advancements in biology, namely, of course, the um, uh, discovery uh, or the formulation of the theory of evolution by Charles Darwin uh, between 1830 and 1850. This um, really spread. So um, uh, here in 1878, um, people were no longer um, satisfied by how the movements of animals were depicted on, on paintings or drawings, because actually, how would you know? And um, so there was always this debate um, if, for example, the horse would need to have its horse feet, um, the hoofs, on the ground. 
So if the horse would at one point uh, um, uh, in its run leave um, the ground entirely, and that could not be, you, you wouldn't see. People had the idea that well, maybe, and Muybridge was commissioned um, uh, by uh, uh, Leland uh, Stanford, a very rich person. So Stanford at the time was the governor of California. He's also the founder of Stanford University in Palo Alto. And at the site of the Stanford University, at the race course, um, Muybridge uh, made his groundbreaking experiments to resolve this uh, debate if actually the horse runs as is depicted on most of the pictures of that time, or if it actually looks differently. And this is what Muybridge did. Muybridge created a series of um, images that were shot within the fraction of a second. And what he did was that he had um, 20 cameras set up with um, uh, uh, um, the exposure starting um, uh, by a thread that would be stepped upon the riding horse. So the horse would ride and um, and uh, uh, would set off the cameras one by one. And by that, this series of photos would depict and of would cut the movement of the horse into um, a series of, of stills. And I think this is a really revolutionary idea that you can cut time into pieces and by that resolve the dimension of time into a series of spatial maps. I think that can't be underestimated how important this discovery was also for the idea of physics, that time might actually not exist as its own thing, but might just be the changes in space uh, of objects, um, as then was uh, more um, uh, rigorously of course, brought into the theory of relativity by Einstein 50 years later. So, and if we look at the horse running, um, we see how well that works. If you just um, put all these images one after the next, you have the invention of the moving image. So, um, uh, the invention of the moving image, you could say, in a way, took place in Palo Alto at the very place where later, uh, to, uh, uh, 150 years later, Google was founded, at the same space where we have all the startup economy of today's, where Stanford University is kind of this incubator of the startup ideology of our digital media economy of Silicon Valley. And that is, of course, not without cause. If we have a bit closer look as who um, was behind that, the financier. So Leland Stanford was a so-called robber baron. The word robber baron is really funny. Um, uh, uh, it comes from a German expression, Raubritter. So the robbing knights. So the, the Raubritter, the, the robber barons in the uh, Middle Ages, in medieval times, 500 years ago or longer, um, were these rogue knights that would set up barriers over streets and would rob merchants that come through by insanely high tariffs for no reason other than they could. So this idea, of course, um, um, uh, has its equivalence in capitalism. So with the uh, invention of the railroad um, uh, and other centralized um, and very expensive infrastructures, people who would own these infrastructures could act like these robber barons and could just take whatever rent uh, uh, they want to uh, extract from uh, people. So in this, um, in this uh, caricature, um, you see uh, the chair of the president of the United States being auctioned uh, to the uh, crowd of the robber barons. You see them all here, uh, all the J.P. Morgans and, um, and, and Rockefellers, and you name them. And one of them here uh, is Leland Stanford. 
So Stanford created uh, Silicon Valley in a way. And uh, so Silicon Valley, I mean, you might say is tied from its inception to this idea of the robber baron, of the rent seeker, um, of this capitalist that is, extracts value out of people. Um, keep that in mind when we transition from these 20th century media uh, to the digital. So the invention of Muybridge and uh, that we now know that horses have their four feet above ground um, um, uh, when they ride, um, so that they actually jump in a way, um, uh, led to a, a lot of um, uh, inspiration for artists. So Frederick Remington is an interesting uh, artist. So he's a, 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 exactly a contemporary of Muybridge's and he was totally fascinated by photography. So he would send photographers around the country and would also go himself. And instead of making sketches, he would make photos of, of scenes that he would then change into pictures, into paintings. Although he would not tell that story himself. He would tell people that he would actually go um, uh, into places and paint there in the, uh, 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 the scenery which was, of course, at that time, not yet possible. I mean, the oil paint in the tube was not yet invented. So it was very difficult, actually, to paint outside your studio. So at that time, I mean, that is the time of early Impressionism, um, Remington um, was a correspondent also and went uh, to Texas and the Southwest to document the Apache Wars. So the settlers would fight against the Apaches uh, to take their land. Uh, to have more uh, grazing grounds for their cattle. This was, of course, a, a genocidal and very brutal war that is told, however, um, to the people on the East Coast uh, totally differently, as you see here in Remington's picture, where the, the righteous cowboys with their firearms are running away with their horses, chased by the wild barbarian Indians coming after them. So um, this picture was Remington's breakthrough as an artist. People found it um, super impressive, the, the big cowboy picture, as they called it. Um, and he would, from that moment on, paint it over and over again. He made bronze statues of horses and became this iconic painter of the Southwest, even if he was from New York City. Yeah, and I mean, it's a short jump uh, from Remington to cinema then. So cinema is the other side that comes out of Muybridge. So we have the horse painting and we have the invention of the photo camera, which actually uh, took also place in France initially by the brothers Lumiere. Um, uh, however, cinema um, was started particularly in the US by Thomas Edison. Edison is not only the inventor uh, of the first commercial successfully light bulb, he is not the inventor of the light bulb at all. The light bulb was invented much earlier and over and over again, people tried to, um, to make the light bulb better uh, uh, and, and not burn through so quickly. So Edison can be credited by first doing um, uh, resolving the problem that the light bulb would immediately burn. However, uh, he is not the inventor of the light bulb, neither is he the inventor of cinema uh, or uh, most of the other things that are credited to him um, in, uh, uh, in kind of the celebration of the engineer genius. Um, so uh, Edison uh, had hold, was, was holding the patent uh, for, uh, for uh, moving pictures in the US. And this um, uh, this patent um, uh, allowed him to control uh, the the content of the cinema um, uh, what was to be displayed. And Edison was convinced that moving images longer than ten minutes would be um, uh, would be damaging to people's health. Uh, so he would prohibit the. Uh, the um, that that uh, uh, any moving image would would exceed that length. Uh, cinema um, people, uh, uh, photographers, they were of course um, 
uh, not amused by that because, I mean, in 10 minutes, you can t tell hardly any meaningful story. And so they would try to evade that. In Europe, it was not so strict. So Edison's patent was not holding in Europe because the Lumieres had uh, uh, obviously uh, invented cinema earlier. So in, in Europe, the development is slightly different. However, the, uh, the development uh, of cinema uh, in the America in, in the US America um, is, is much more powerful than in Europe because the market is so much bigger. There's so many more people. And a city like New York City, for example, um, I mean, if you have a cinema there, it's easy to get many people um, watching your movie. It's much, much more difficult if you have to go with the movie from one small town to the other. So there is a lot um, kind of um, a lot of movement um, in, the, uh, in the economic um, development of the cinema and Edison was in the way of it. And I mean, this is what people always do. If someone is in your way, you try to evade that. And people were doing that early on. The first who would leave is a legendary um, uh, uh, filmmaker, um, uh, D.W. Griffith. So Griffith um, is really the first uh, director and producer of movies that are really long. And he knew that he could never do that in New York. So he would cross the continent and would go, I mean, very uh, much in, in Mulbritt's idea, to the West Coast. Uh, he would go to Southern California, however. So he would end up in Pasadena in uh, South uh, California and would find Pasadena very pleasant and said, this is exactly where I want to shoot. No one is in my way. Uh, California is, is hardly a state yet. I mean, it's uh, everything is totally pioneer there. No one will care if I infringe Edison's copyright law here. And, and this is exactly what happened um, in the foundation of Hollywood. So Hollywood is um, beginning at this moment in time um, when, uh, when Griffith uh, uh, would go um, and, and shoot his first movie um, in, in, in what then will become Los Angeles. So the rise of Los Angeles is tied to the rise of Hollywood, um, the city of, um, of actors, uh, of the creative industry in the 20th century. And that, of course, um, it was not only it was not only the, the people evading um, uh, Edison's patent, which then expired, and then they could go back and, and, and make movies everywhere. It was then, of course, in particular um, in the 1920s and 30s, creative people from Europe fleeing the oppression by the fascists in Italy, in Germany, and then, of course, in all of Europe that was occupied by Germany. That uh, uh, who came to uh, came to Los Angeles um, and and uh, uh, and of course were, became part of this um, global uh, creative crowd um, that would made movies great. By the way, the first movie ever shot uh, is believed uh, to be um, uh, the. Uh, Western movie, Kidnapping by Indians, from 1899. Funny enough, that was shot in Manchester in the UK. And it is, of course, exactly what you see on the movies um, uh, uh, all over until the 1960s. It is evil Indians doing bad things to white people. I mean, here you see John Ford's um, seminal um, uh, Western stagecoach, which is uh, with John Wayne. Um, this is this stagecoach uh, that gets attacked um, and, uh, and uh, figures on the stagecoach uh, get to know each other by that and, and, and have this joint adventure, this kind of this uh, uh, movie of the siege. And you see, I mean, the similarity to Remington painting is striking here in 1939. And of course, the Western plays a huge role in retelling the narrative of the genocide that was committed against um, the uh, First Nation people um, uh, over the course uh, of the 19th and early 20th century. Yeah, um, closely tied with what I uh, said with uh, Edison is the idea um, 
of uh, um, um, the uh, uh, infrastructure that someone could own. I mean, you remember uh, uh, Leland Stanford being the robber baron. I mean, he was also the president of the Union Pacific Railroad. So he actually owned railroads. And in the 19th century, the railway, the steam engine train um, is kind of the leading technology that was there. And what happened in the 19th century is that travel times um, were uh, increasingly shrinking. Um, Francis Galton, um, another interesting character, so Galton is a son-in-law of Charles Darwin and is really one of the people that made ja uh, Darwin's um, theory uh, of evolution uh, popular in the world. He is also the person who invented eugenics. So Galton... Um, used his mathematical uh, knowledge. He was a very gifted mathematician without doubt. Um, uh, and uh, uh, his uh, work in probability theory uh, for the argumentation in favor of racism and, um, and discrimination uh, uh, of uh, lesser able people, ableism. So this is called eugenics, the idea that you have to uh, push forward good genes and suppress bad genes. We all know what it leads to. That was, of course, in particularly well adopted uh, in the Third Reich by the Nazis in Germany and led to the Holocaust as uh, kind of the uh, total ecstasy uh, of the idea of eugenics. Horrible things came out of, uh, uh, of the idea um, in the 19th century of this engineering of science uh, for the uh, uh, for um, uh, a normative uh, idea, so kind of the saying science is not about um, things that we see in the world, but it is there is some kind of uh, moral good behind science. That was in particular then, of course, the fascist and the Nazi ideology. So Galton also invented um, uh, an interesting form of map. It's called the isochron map. So uh, isos, isos means the same, means um, yeah, uh, uh, equal, um, and uh, uh, chronos is the time. So isochron um, is a line of same time. And uh, what this map depicts is travel times. So you see the green is what you can reach from London within two days. And then comes the yellow which is um, uh, like uh, more than 10 days and then, and so on. And you come, um, that uh, there is a huge part of the world which takes you uh, around 1818, uh, still more than 40 days, so more than a month. So Europe is basically in, in the isochrome of a week or two of travel. Um, however, I mean, you, you get the idea that that is too long to maintain a nation. So a nation that uh, is kind of the idea that that comes um, uh, comes here um, should be um, should be organized in a way that you can reach each border within a day's travel. The idea of travel within forty days to any uh, any part of the world, of course, leads to Jules Verne's famous novel around the world in 80 days. It is a really marvelous book to read. I, mean, is a, I can only recommend that you have a look at it. It is a great read. Um, uh, Jules Verne, a um, French author, I mean, he was very diligent. I mean, he would lo look up every detail. Um, so um, uh, uh, all, the, all the things that Phileas Fogg, the mysterious millionaire, uh, from London that he, he experiences all over the travel um, are, uh, uh, are fact-backed, so to say, uh, by, uh, by Verne. I mean, of course, it's not the facts that we would think of nowadays. It's the facts that Verne would find in newspapers and travel journals. So there is a lot, of course, fish tales in that, a lot of things that don't exist in the real, in the real world, but that existed in people's mind at that time. So uh, uh, around the world in 80 days is a time capsule of colonial thinking. And by that, it is absolutely worth reading. Um, and it, uh, it describes, um, uh, it has been shot into, uh, into movies of, uh, many times. It describes this journey um, that uh, Fogg does traveling east um, across 
all the countries um, to Asia. Um, I mean, he, um, he he goes through the Middle East. He goes through India, um, uh, Burma, today is Myanmar, um, China, and then crosses the Pacific, crosses the American continent from San Francisco to New York and then takes a ship back uh, um, to Liverpool and then the railroad back to London and then thinks he has lost his bet and is now a poor man because he lost all his money in the bet that he would make it in 80 days and it's the 81st day on his calendar in his diary and then realizes, however, that he miscalculated because he crossed the date line because he was traveling eastward, he would, he would gain a day and that it is actually time and he comes to his club and wins and, uh, of course, uh, uh, in triumph and marries his uh, um, the love that he found in India, the princess that he met, and all ends well. So this is the story of uh, Phileas Fogg, uh, Jules Verne's novel uh, in 80 Days Around the World. So this is an isochrone map um, a bit later than Galton's um, of France. Here we don't have days, we have hours of travel in France. And you see already the development of very fast, very rapid transport um, um, that is the railroad lines. So the railroad was invented in 1828. It is a development that was intentionally triggered by investments. So um, the idea to put cars on rails is old. I think that is centuries that people have used that in mining to carry out the rocks from the mine um, on these railroad, on these rail driven cars. I mean, the first rail is actually, you see, um, uh, uh, um, 2,500 years or so ago, for example, in Pestum uh, near, near Naples, there is these, um, these uh, uh, carvings in the streets that would keep um, uh, the, the tracks uh, for the coaches, um, so you couldn't move left or right with your coach. You know that story may be from Oedipus. So Oedipus um, uh, um, is this legendary uh, hero who kills his father in rage that his father, he didn't know that it was his father, by the way, comes against him in a car and he can't move out of the way and his father wouldn't move out, uh, out of his way either because both cars are in the tracks. And then he kills his father and marries his mother, and hence the Oedipus complex in psychology. So tracks um, for the use of transport have been around a long time, but what mattered is the invention of the steam engine. And in 1828, there was this um, uh, sweepstakes, was kind of this um, um, competition. Who would build an engine that would actually um, uh, uh, be able to drive a train? And that uh, uh, was Stevenson's engine rocket. And then it, it took only like five years and you would have trains all over Europe and the railroad business was kicked off. There's a really major economic um, uh, endeavor. Uh, the, the amount of steel that was used um, in uh, building the railroads, for example, uh, the transcontinental railroads, in the United States in the 1860s, the amount of steel would exceed by far any kind of steel production that was known before. So it was not only driving an incredible economic upswing in all the steel regions in Europe, like for example in Northern England, as well as in the Ruhr Valley in mid-Germany, Midwest Germany, but also this rocket rise of the steel and mining areas um, in the United States itself and the fairy tale fortunes that were made by people like Carnegie, Andrew Carnegie um, and uh, Andrew Mellon, these people who made billions of dollars, the first billionaires in history, the first people ever to become so rich. And then the robber barons who would own the railroads, um, who would become rich by just charging people to, to use that service. But still, I mean, compared to travel on horseback on a coach across the continent, I mean, that was just not an option. I mean, travel time with the railroad was reduced from like three months travel between New York and San Francisco to less than a week within a few years. So that is really a major advancement in what is able 
um, to keep a nation together. So um, speaking of which, um, this is a very nice railroad map that someone made. Um, I, I've seen the, uh, the original uh, somewhere, but I couldn't find it. But this is a, this is a contemporary uh, map. I put in the, uh, the link to uh, Stefan Steinbach's uh, blog on transportation. So you see the Austro-Hungarian Empire before the First World War. And you see, um, if you compare that to France, France is really very compact. It's almost circular, and every part of the uh, of the French um, nation of the French uh, um, state could be reached within a day from Paris. This is not true for the Austria-Hungarian Empire. Even between Vienna and Budapest, the two major cities, um, uh, the travel time. Uh, was already almost a day. It was about six to seven hours. It is, by the way, still. So railroad traffic has not become faster since then. Uh, we reach, I think, uh, the, the maximum speed of railways uh, around 1900, which is really remarkable. I mean, thinking to that the technology has matured that early, um, and uh, despite uh, high-speed trains that we have today, actually, I mean, staying at a station and waiting for other trains um, takes uh, its toll. So um, uh, the Austria-Hungarian uh, Empire um, uh, has large parts um, that are not easy to reach. Um, if you look here down in South Slavia, um, like the, uh, the, the most southern part uh, in, in what is today Croatia and Bosnia-Herzegovina, um, as well as the most eastern parts, which is Galicia, today's Ukraine, for example, um, they are just too far. I mean, if something happens there, it takes forever uh, to take action from Vienna. So this is regarded one of the causes why the Austrian Hungarian Empire just broke apart so, um, so easily in the First World War. So time and railroads are very closely connected. You can't run railroad um, without proper timekeeping. And uh, uh, there's a very manifest reason for that. Not only people want to know when their train arrives, it is also um, a, a crucial feature of railroad safety to know the times. So this drawing shows, shows so-called world lines. Um, it is a representation of the movements of trains on tracks. So um, it is, uh, um, it is uh, Indonesia, and this map was made by a Japanese engineer. I will uh, tell a bit more in a second. So just so that you understand what it does. So on the left-hand side, you see the elevation of the railroad track. So you see where there is a steep, um, uh, um, um, uh, steep decline or uh, incline um, uh, of the uh, elevation. And you see the average speed that the train can therefore achieve in a certain track. The um, horizontal lines mark uh, the stations. So um, if you look uh, on top, you have uh, uh, Sorabaya um, in the island, on the island of, of Java. And we follow now a train that leaves Sorabaya station at 2 o'clock in the morning. So you see the train runs and um, the distance is going to the, uh, um, uh, uh, um, in the vertical while the time progresses um, uh, in the horizontal. At the same time, at two o'clock in the morning, um, another train leaves Jombang. And you see, if you follow the lines, that at one point they will meet. And you have to time the point where they meet uh, here in uh, Mojokerto, which I don't know, of Sorabaya, at least I've heard before. I've never been to Indonesia. So you have to time that out with the average speed that the train has in, uh, uh, in that um, uh, part of the rails, so that they meet at the point where there is multiple tracks for the trains to pass. And it's, of course, easiest in a station that had multiple platforms. And here on the right-hand side, you see sketches on how many uh, platforms there are. And then you can time out your timetable. 
So the interesting thing is, I mean, so um, this is exactly how uh, how train schedules are uh, timed out to this day. Um, it's now done, of course, with computers. Um, but uh, um, I mean, when I was a young person uh, um, in the late 1980s and decided to study mathematics um, and I looked into the calculation of uh, uh, frame schedules I was really fascinated by that that was more or less ex actually how uh, it was done in Germany at that time still so you would have these sheets and would draw the lines and the slope of the line shows the uh, average speed of the train in that um, uh, section of the uh, rail track this map however that I showed you here, this um, this diagram was not made by a railroad engineer from Indonesia. It was made by a Japanese spy. So before invading Indonesia in the Second World War, Japanese had uh, so Japan, the Japanese Empire had long figured out the um, infrastructure that was needed. Um, to make that invasion seamlessly happening. And one part was to understand the railroad um, uh, uh, logistics. And so the Japanese spy would time out um, how the train would run and by that reconstruct the possibilities um, for, for having trains running in Indonesia. So this is not only showing you how, uh, how railroads uh, are organized, this is also a very nice um, moment uh, to, to uh, um, step back a bit and think of how technology and communication always have these sides of military, of warfare, of doing things in, a, in an evil way. So timing um, railroads is really crucial. So and either um, you, you um, do that not in an efficient way. I mean, if you if you just rely on um, one train coming in and then let the other train uh, leave, um, uh, of course your your timetable um, gets rather sparsely populated. And so, if you want to have trains following uh, each other um, in, in in a short frequency, you need better communication. And almost at the same time um, when the railroad uh, was uh, invented. Another invention took place, which is the uh, telegraph. So um, in uh, 1844, uh, Samuel Morse, uh, an American engineer, um, invented the first, uh, the first uh, telegraph that actually uh, became, uh, again, economically um, uh, worthwhile. However, it was not the first telegraph, as we shall see in a second. At almost the same time, in 1846, um, uh, the railroad companies started uh, to build telegraph lines at the same time when they would lay the rails. So it was basically just like 15 years after the first railways were built uh, that already telegraph lines were directly tied uh, to the railroad. And that um, and mainly for the reason uh, um, of controlling the signals. So to control a signal, I mean, that was manual work at first. So you would signal with a telegraph to the signal post, now make the signal red and let the train stop. And then the person would go out and switch the signal, which were semaphore at the times. You remember the semaphores, they, were, they had arms, levers that would go up and down um, uh, to show the, the, uh, the trains that the track ahead was not free, was not empty. Not, and uh, and uh, uh, later, of course, that uh, was automized and with telegraphic signals, you could actually trigger the movements uh, of the signal uh, or switch light signals uh, after the invention uh, of the light bulb um, from green to red. So this is signaling signaling and the telegraph are tied to the uh, to the railroads and of course it is also i mean if you think of a transcontinental telegraph line building a telegraph line for example from new york um, to the west coast from new york to san francisco or to los angeles you have to maintain that i mean the, the line will not be there for all the time and you have to have people taking care of it and if you have a railway next you just bring people with the train and then they uh, have a look 
it's much easier to maintain telegraph lines across the country alongside another a, a line of transportation. So 1846 marks this combination of railroad business with telegraphs. Just to mention, the telegraph was not invented by Morse. It was much, much earlier invented. There's a, a whole series again uh, um, that, that leads to it. Uh, this here uh, is the so-called Western telegraph. Um, I like the uh, uh, optical um, uh, beauty of it. So it would use five lines. There's an arbitrary number. You can use any number of lines, but uh, that is how the pattern specified it. It was five lines, and each line um, could be put under current separately. So, and then the current would flow and these small compass needles would receive an electric current uh, that would only uh, create a, a magnetic field around the one needle. And so you could have each of these needles being moved independently. And then you have, um, like, think of the, uh, the, um, the needle on the left-hand side um, uh, being um, shifted um, uh, clockwise. And maybe um, the, uh, the needle um, in the middle counterclockwise. And you see where they intersect. Uh, that is at the letter E. And so you can convey messages by uh, letting the needles um, switch and then someone just write down where they intersect. It's not totally practical, but I mean, it's a meaningful way um, to, uh, to telegraph. And I think it is really important um, uh, if we look at these dead media, uh, these media that didn't make it to the mainstream, so to say, that uh, uh, were not so successful in the end. I mean, they are interesting, nevertheless, as user interfaces. I mean, if you look at this um, uh, lozenge um, and how different it looks than what we think nowadays of a screen, uh, thinking of uh, making interactive media, I mean, this is an interactive medium. I mean, the, uh, uh, the, um, it, it could receive and it could send. You see the, um, the keyboard in front of it by which you would turn the needles to signal your counterpart. So the telegraph is really one of the first interactive media. I mean, of course, the Morse telegraph is the really important invention. The Morse telegraph does something um, that we learned already um, that has proven very useful. It serializes information. So this is exactly what an alphabet does. It cuts information into uh, pieces that are linear. And um, uh, you, you remember the debate uh, on the alphabet. I mean, to what extent that actually uh, uh, has this kind of impact. I mean, this is a question of techno determinism. I mean, is this, this linearization, the alphabet that causes all the rest of it? I mean, the fact is, however, that um, writing an alphabet into Morse code is quite straightforward. So whatever, um, you might take from the uh, debate about the alphabet. One thing is that Morse built a machine that perfectly worked for the alphabet because you had these, uh, um, these uh, short and long uh, electric pulses. I mean, actually, it is the breaks between two pulses um, that you, uh, by which uh, you would create um, the lineup of letters. You um, know how Moscow works. I mean, it's just these short dots um, uh, or longer lines. And actually, it is just um, the pause between two electric pulses. And here, this is the, uh, the receiver side of the Moscow, which is an electromagnet that pulls down the lever when an electric pulse arrives, so the pulse arrives, the electricity comes through the wire, the magnets are employed and, um, and the lever is torn down and creates a clicking sound. So it is actually the pauses between the clicks that make the letter. And you remember that from the first lecture, that is a so-called zero sign. So it's the pauses, it's not the clicks that matter. Yeah, and that's the Morse, um, uh, Morse device. 
Well, with railroads and the Morse code and cinemas, um, with Edison's patterns, we enter an interesting time um, in, the, um, uh, uh, in the 19th century, which is the time of monopolies. So communication and technology uh, is very much in the 19th and 20th century tied to defending or destroying monopolies. And what is a monopoly? A monopoly is when you own something and exclude competition. There's a, a, a monopole means that it is, there's just one. And uh, uh, the opposite, uh, of course, is uh, polypoles, which is a word that doesn't exist, or multiple poles. Um, there's a word that is very similar to monopolies, that is oligopolies. So uh, oligo means a few. So many monopolies are actually not monopolies, but uh, oligopolies. So there is only a few companies monopolizing everything. So you could think of digital technology today being an oligopoly between, for example, Apple, Google, Facebook, um, Amazon, uh, and so on, the so-called but fang, that is Baidu, uh, Alibaba, Tencent, uh, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, uh, Microsoft, Google, but fang. It's only um, put into that, uh, I think, sequence of letters uh, to make it sound somehow Chinese. I think there's no other reason. So that is monopolies and uh, or oligopolies. And uh, one of the most notorious uh, uh, monopolies, of course, was the telephone uh, monopoly uh, that took place um, in a long time. So um, um, telephones, uh, when I was uh, younger, I mean, this is uh, 1980s or 90s, looked like this. Um, uh, they had uh, electro-engineered um, um, bodies with magnets in it and um, and uh, electromagnetic wiring. There's no electronics in these telephones. They're totally electromechanical. And, um, and so it was an electrical engineering business. It is not yet digital at all. It is totally analog. Uh, uh, um, analog. And um, however, the telephone was not the first monopoly. The first, as we have seen, uh, is um, um, is uh, is the movie. The movie first by Edison and then by the Hollywood studios was really monopolized. There was really not much competition going on. So this is a picture of D.W. Griffith's um, uh, movie, uh, Old California, which was the first movie that he shot 1910 in Hollywood. This is the first movie ever produced in what is today Hollywood. Of course, at that time, it was not yet Hollywood because um, Hollywood was just uh, um, a hill, basically. Uh, in so technology um, has a lot to do with monopolies, um, and that is uh, uh, so. The argumentation goes as follows: um, So there is the patent. Why would you get a patent for an invention? So the patent um, is the idea behind the patent. Um, uh, in the 18th century, when that uh, concept was first introduced in England is that you keep inventors from making a secret of their invention. So the, 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 the state, the government, had an interest in incentivizing inventors in making their invention public. However, if an inventor makes uh, uh, their invention public, and what, what does he gain from them, what, 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 uh, or she? So what do inventors gain from public uh, publishing? Um, only that someone else makes the money out of their invention. And a patent resolves that. So you get a patent granted for your invention only if you publish your invention and everyone can see it and can use it. However, it entitles you to get paid for it. So this is the idea behind the patent. And actually it is an interesting a kind of empowering idea. It's the same idea behind authorship and copyright that an author is incentivized to publishing their work, however, um, is protected from exploitation. So this is the idea behind the patent. But of course, in the 19th century, that kind of degraded and led to monopolizing inventions because big companies could finance research and could kind of amass patterns and prevent other people 
from uh, uh, making these inventions. It was most notoriously, of course, Edison as one of the first persons um, to, to uh, make really that uh, into an industry. I mean, he would, in his Menlo Park lab uh, in New Jersey, he would just mass produce patterns um, uh, just to secure almost any business that he would think of. Uh, uh, very similar, but a bit different, um, is the approach that the telephone took. So the telephone was in the uh, 1870s um, invented, I mean the first usable telephone at least, by an inventor called um, uh, Alexander Graham Bell. And um, Bell was not such a great business person, but I mean, he started his first telephone company, but it was his assistant, Thomas Watson. And Watson saw that, um, uh, that the uh, telephone would be of immense strategic um, uh, importance to any government. And he would actually convince the American government that the telephone would be so incredibly important that his company, the Bell Telephone Company would be granted the exclusive monopoly for first long distance calls and then any kind of telephone calls in America. And by that, of course, AT&T, the American Telephone and Telegraph Company, became insanely rich. The monopoly, of course, came at a price. I mean, the uh, government in the US, they were not that stupid or corrupt. Uh, they would demand, on the other hand, that the research that the Bell Company would do would be basically public. And so um, the Bell Company was obliged to run an extensive research laboratory, the Bell Labs, which is another um, um, enormous driver of science and inventions in Silicon Valley, in Palo Alto, uh, where these labs uh, had been. So um, the, um, yeah, the, the monopoly of the AT&T, of the American Telephone and Telegraph Company is really an amazing one because it is not state run. It is a private monopoly. In other parts of the world that played out differently, like for example, um, in many um, parts of Europe, in Germany, for example, where the state-owned post would have the telephone and telegraph, same in, uh, in most parts of Europe. So uh, it was also a monopoly, but it was a publicly owned monopoly here. It was a privately run monopoly in the United States. For reason that I find hard to understand, but I mean, if you're interested in that, read the book by Tim Wu, The Master Switch. It's a great book about uh, uh, the up and down of technologies and regulation. This is why you have it in your readings. Um, I totally encourage you to read whatever you find in that book. Uh, it's absolutely worthwhile. Um, so it took like into the 1980s when um, a court ruling finally broke up the monopoly of AT&T into what's called the baby bells. So there were these economically independent smaller companies and then um, with uh, the um, uh, um, rise of the first truly privately um, uh, owned competitors of the uh, AT&T network like Sprint, um, um, actually competition in the US telephone network started. At the same time, in most of Europe, the um, state-owned uh, television uh, um, uh, telephone networks were privatized too. So um, the telecoms, the tele or telcos, the te te telecommunication companies, um, like in Germany, like in France, in Italy, in the UK, were privatized and broken up. Um, Italy, I think, was the first country uh, uh, to have that. It had a lot of uh, political um, uh, issues behind that, uh, to which we come in a second. So what we had then is kind of this multitude of very small um, uh, telephone companies that were acting independently and were leasing out, of course, their capacities to one each other. They were obliged to do that by the law. If you look to the United States these days, this is no longer how it looks. We are back. AT&T is back at its monopoly. And it's interesting to ask why that is. And of course, again, it is not a technological reason why that is. 
it is an entirely political one. In um, the aftermath of uh, the um, World Trade Center uh, attack in 2001, um, the Bush administration started what's um, uh, uh, called the war against terror. And one of that uh, uh, war against terror things is, um, is uh, for example, the Patriot Act. And many of these, uh, many of these uh, political um, um, yeah, uh, regulations uh, targeted um, inf information infrastructure. Some of it leaked in 2006 already when it became clear that AT&T, the telephone company that kind of mysteriously got together uh, uh, their, their monopoly again and would be exempt from uh, oversight uh, from antitrust regulations by presidential executive orders, um, when, um, when it became clear that there were special uh, rooms in, um, uh, in the telephone uh, switches for the National Security Administration, which is America's signal intelligence branch. So signal intelligence is the part of military and civil reconnaissance. So that means gathering information that deals with passively getting this information. So there's two ways of intelligence um, gathering of reconnaissance. One is spying, which means that you go somewhere with this, I mean, you have to send people like you have um, a plane flying over a country and making photographs or a satellite making photographs from high up or people on the ground um, sniffling through documents um, in other people's offices and whatever. So this is, opera this is operative. This is the active act of spying. And on the other hand, uh, you have signal intelligence, which is listening to what people communicate. Signal intelligence is really old. I mean, the oldest examples of signal intelligence is really to antiquity, um, where, where uh, it was already common. I mean, like 2,500 years ago, people in, invented all kinds of ciphers already um, to protect their communication from spies reading them. And um, signal intelligence since the 19th century has a lot to do with the communication infrastructure. So as soon as there were telegraph lines set up, people started tempering with them. You remember the sharp telegraph, which is not electric, it is just optical, it's a semaphore. And the Count of Monte Cristo in the novel um, by Dumas bribing uh, the telegraph operator to um, to convey false information from Madrid to Paris. So that shows you that attacks on the uh, communication lines, on the uh, information infrastructure, are a strong driver um, in the uh, in the 19th century and in the 20th century, of course, with the two wars um, uh, that made it so clear that information superiority is really war deciding, is victory deciding, um, um, signal intelligence became a major part uh, uh, of uh, military strategy. So the NSA, the National um, Security Administration, um, has hundreds of thousands of people working for them and um, doing the reconnaissance with the intercepted information. And Breaking up AT&T was a nightmare for the spies. I mean, you can't spy on people easily if you not, don't know which network they will use. So it's much harder. And so it was much, much easier, of course, to bring that back together and only have one telephone company to deal with. And the nice... Uh, 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 the nice uh, names of these uh, of these um, uh, strategic uh, operation um, initiatives in the NSA uh, uh, show you. I mean, kind of the, the mindset I think of the people. Or look at the design of the slides. I mean, this is from the slide text that Edward Snowden smuggled out of the NSA. So Snowden 
leaked all these informations and basically it's PowerPoint slides looking horrible. I mean, they're really the worst in terms of design and then these names, Fairview, you know, this typeface casting a shadow. I mean, it's really like a joke. Yeah, so you see, um, this is the Fairview special source operation. So SSO special source operation, that means exactly targeting an information infrastructure to extract information. Uh, all these, uh, um, uh, all these uh, abbreviations, of course, I mean, it is top secret, that is uh, easy to understand. SI means um, special intelligence, um, um, yeah, uh, no foreign uh, means uh, no foreigners are allowed to look on that. So this is the reason why we have telephone monopolies uh, uh, more and more, at least uh, uh, why that shifted immediately after the uh, um, American phone company was broken up. In other countries, it played out differently in the first place. I mean, countries uh, uh, where the telephone infrastructure was set up much more planned, um, like here in the UAE, uh, of course, um, the uh, control of the government over the telecommunication industry is much stricter. Yeah, the monopolies. Um, so this is one idea of monopoly is this uh, monopolizing access to information for the reason of control and surveillance. Um, another one is more physical and has much more to do uh, actually with technology. It is the uh, limit of bandwidth. So we have now um, covered uh, um, photography, uh, the movies, telephone lines and railroads as technology that is kind of earthbound, so to say. It is technology um, that requires infrastructure in the form of cables or rail tracks um, that has to do with physical um, installations everywhere. And um, we now transition um, into the field of electronics, finally. So um, the German physicist Hertz um, uh, discovered that um, if you um, light an electric spark uh, between two poles, two electrodes, uh, you can induce a spark in uh, between two electrons uh, that have the same distance at a distance. So you have this um, sending a spark across the room. So you light a spark here and a spark lights here too. And by that, I mean, understanding the potential of electromagnetic waves that had been um, uh, uh, first understood by Maxwell a bit earlier as a means of transporting information. However, these sparks is a tricky thing. So if you um, have this spark, um, uh, it creates um, uh, an electromagnetic wave that's pervasive. So you can only, uh, only have a spark at the time, so to say, and to make that work, um, you need to limit the um, electromagnetic waves to what is called a bandwidth. So you can't just clutter the whole spectrum of frequencies or wavelengths with your sparks as Hertz would have done. You need to understand how to limit the spark to create only um, uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation as a certain wavelength. And this is what uh, the Marconis did. Uh, so Marconi, um, uh, uh, an Italian uh, um, British inventor uh, who, uh, who created the first um, radio transmitters that were com commercially uh, useful and uh, uh, also understood that you could use the Morse code um, to create these electromagnetic pulses without the use of wires. And out of that comes the cable and wireless company as um, a communication company that uses electromagnetic radiation to transport information, Morse code at first, but soon people would uh, see that you could pack all kinds of information into these electromagnetic pulses. So, the bandwidth thing is really important. Um, so if you have one radio station that sends its electromagnetic waves and you have a second uh, sending at the same wavelengths, and if they meet, it comes to interferences. So, they, they, uh, so you get uh, a mess up and you can't listen to these stations anymore or see their, their broadcasts or whatever. So it is really important to have a regime 
controlling the bandwidth. And this is, um, this is for example, um, how that is done in the uh, um, UAE. Let's just uh, give an example. So uh, from uh, 800 megahertz, that means 800 um, um, uh, oscillations per second, uh, 800 uh, megahertz, 800 million to three gigahertz is uh, three billion uh, oscillations. This is the bandwidth of the ultra high frequency. This is the normal radio and um, television frequency nowadays. And you see how uh, exact the bandwidth is divided between different applications here. And it is really important um, internationally to keep that clean. So there is a regime between countries. It's the International Te Telecommunication Union, ITU. Um, it's an international transnational body uh, that negotiates the usage of these frequencies. Otherwise, we would have total clutter and radio communication would just not be possible. What that, of course, means is that before electronics was capable enough um, to have um, digital um, information being sent. As long as you have analog in, uh, information, analog needs a lot of bandwidth, needs a lot of wavelength, a lot of frequency in one band, you have a very limited number of different radio stations and different television stations that you can maintain. And uh, until the 1980s, that was basically three. So this is not a lot. So you could not have more than three television stations in one country, in one area that would be under one transmitter. So and that has to do with the three frequency ban uh, bands um, in the uh, ultra high frequency. So, and, um, I mean, when I was a child, uh, a television set would have a knob with just three stations on it because that was all there was. And it took a while um, to get more into that. Yeah, television has grandious infrastructure. Um, it was broadcast. That means it is sent out from a transmitter. And um, since uh, these high frequencies are easily distorted, I mean, they basically only travel as, at the line of sight. Any kind of hill, um, even a forest or so might uh, already disturb them. Um, hence, the invention of the tower, of the transmission tower. So the television tower is in many cities still an iconic uh, building. So here, the uh, Torre de Coiserola, uh, the um, famous television tower uh, on the Tibidabo mountain um, uh, in Barcelona, that was built uh, by Sir Norman Foster in 1992. And of course, this is one of the last great television towers built. Because 1992, that is just the year uh, where the web will start. Yeah, television is called the idiot's lantern. Um, so um, uh, in my generation, uh, my parents' generation would always, so my parents were not like that, but many people my parents' age would always tell us, you become stupid if you watch um, too much television. If you, if you look onto the screen all the time, that is just bad for you. And um, uh, so this caricature by the New Yorker is from 1950. It is already kind of this idea that looking into the screen makes you sad, uh, or at least makes you not happy. And there is something to say for that. I mean, thinking of our digital media um, and your experiment uh, of digital fasting. I mean, there is, of course, um, the aspect of advertising. Um, while all media channels uh, of the 19th and 20th century had been used for advertising. I mean, newspapers, magazines, uh, billboards, I mean, all uh, carry advertising. The radio, of course, carried advertising and propaganda, which is pop political advertising and were used for manipulation. With television, however, advertising became much, much more powerful. And this is a story that I can tell by heart because this is exactly where I worked. So advertising in television works totally different uh, than in print. So in print, in newspapers and magazines, it was always important that your ad would be meaningful. Otherwise, people would overlook it. So the attention was not enough. It was important that your message would stick. So 
there was a lot of creativity therefore put into print ads to make them stick with people's minds. That is the rise of the advertising agencies between 1900 and 1930. And with television, however, it became clear that it is almost irrelevant what is on your ad as long as people see the ad often enough. And I can tell you that it's true. So there, if, you, if your ad shows your company and you have your logo and then says the product name, that is sufficient already to, to make people remember it and to significantly increase your um, sales. And this is a very interesting fact. Um, I think it was not fully understood before the mid to end 90s that that was actually the case. But at that time, measurement of television audiences had become precise enough uh, to prove this. So you would show that if you have one region where your ad was aired, when it would be broadcast over the air, hence the name, to be aired, and another region where it wasn't, and otherwise everything is the same, then you would see that your sales would rise at the region where your ad was shown versus the region where it wasn't. And you could calculate um, all the curves of saturation. So how much money do I actually uh, have to put into my uh, advertising campaign to get the most out of it? And this led to the um, rise of media planning. Media planning is the uh, science uh, or uh, the yeah, uh, social science, so to say, of optimizing the impact of messages in media channels, in particular, of course, in television and nowadays in electronic media. And uh, we would not have, I think, the idea of advertising targeting and um, the enormous uh, uh, economical success of Google and Facebook without first under, having understood how advertising actually works on screen media. So this is really a fascinating um, uh, thing um, to look into that. I mean, if you want a, a deeper look into that, just watch the series Mad Men. Um, it's very well done. I can tell you there is a lot of truth in that uh, about media industry, not only about the time when uh, it plays, like the 1960s and 70s, but there is actually a lot of things um, in the series Mad Men that tell you the story of media today. What, of course, took place at the time of television was the Cold War. So the Cold War was for the first time um, in modern history that the world fell into these supranational blocks. And if you think of the Western bloc, that was, of course, not only the US and England, there were all kinds of countries in that bloc, like Germany, um, France, Italy, uh, but also uh, um, uh, in Asia, countries that would, um, would count into that bloc, like Japan. So people in these countries, in these cultures, would not share one language. They would not share one culture, actually. And Television is a medium that works with images, images that are totally persuading. And these images work without language. So it is much easier to understand what's going on in a different place if you see them in a television image, in a video image, than in reading about that in a foreign language that had to first be translated before most people could understand it in the first place. So television as a medium of indoctrination is directly tied with the time of the Cold War. And that is the so-called iconic turn. You remember that there is the linguistic turn, which is the turn towards newspaper, that most information was suddenly written and printed. And the iconic turn in the 20th century is going away from that and falling back into an optical world. That is, however, not like the oral pre-literate world. It is a different kind of information that is conveyed through television. The most iconic of all television images, of course, is when the television didn't work. 
So um, the test pattern was invented uh, to understand what's wrong with your television set. And the television uh, test image, if you want to look that up, has all kinds of details on it that shows you if they don't look exactly like here, that uh, uh, which part of the TV is actually not working. So is it the phase that is shifted? Um, and by that, the colors would not match uh, exactly. Um, is it uh, horizontal or vertical resolution? Is it um, uh, the building of the lines? Whatever electromagnetic uh, impact uh, in the tube, in the cathode tube that uh, would uh, draw the image line by line on the screen, um, uh, would cause a distortion you could see on the test pattern. So this test pattern would also show up when a television station would fail to broadcast. So that would come up um, as a default by the television uh, transmission towers. And in the 1980s and 90s, a lot of art was made. Like here, for example, General Idea, that is a Canadian uh, artist collective. Um, uh, they uh, made a lot of Fluxus-inspired multiples. We'll look a bit more into um, electronic media art uh, later uh, in this uh, course. So here you see a test pattern on a plate. And you can buy that. Um, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a multiple, that means it's a work of art um, that exists in multiple, ex uh, um, multiple examples um, uh, on sale much cheaper than if it would just be the, uh, the unique piece of art. And I think the most famous of all television artists is also, I would say, uh, the most influential of the early interactive media artists. It is Nam Jun Paik. So Namjoon Paik um, is, um, is a um, Korean um, educated in Germany, um, lived uh, most of his life in the United States and Germany, um, who uh, studied art and was a, uh, one of the disciples of Joseph Beuys. Um, he was um, inspired by John Cage. Um, and is one of the key people um, in, the, uh, in the Fluxus movement. Um, and his medium of making art is the television screen. And this work of art that uh, type built here um, uh, was, uh, 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 was one um, that I particularly enjoyed. It was um, shown in the Venice Biennial in uh, 1933, in, in 19, uh, sorry, 1993, um, 1993, so um, uh, 30 years ago um, in Venice, um, in the German pavilion, um, and it had this uh, totally iconic title, Electronic Superhighway Venice Ulan Bator. So Namjoon Paik, is the person who coined uh, the name electronic superhighway for dig digital technology and by that became really the uh, iconic uh, artist uh, of interactive media um, laying the ground um, for what we will follow up now in the next uh, lecture, digital media and the internet.